Hello everyone and welcome to our panel on neurodiversity, accessibility and ableism in tabletop gaming. Uh, today I have some really wonderful guests with me from around the world and from different parts of the tabletop community. That's RPGs and board games and players, designers and players both. Uh, so we're going to start off with some introductions. I am Sean Sunday, a board game designer, a TTRPG player, and I also design content for uh, D and D, and I have ADHD. Over to the left of the screen, we have Nick. Nick, introduce yourself for the audience. Hey, my name's Nick. Um, my pronouns are they them, and I am a pretty fresh player to the tabletop community. And uh, my neurodiversity is that I have ADHD. And we have Chantel as well. Hey, I am Chantel B. Um, I have, I, my pronouns are they, she. Um, I've been part of the tabletop community for a little bit. I'm a, a narrative writer and a player uh, and a streamer. Um, I'm also a psychologist, so I'm here under that capacity, but also um, as yet to be diagnosed ADHD, synesthesia, and dyscalculia. If we have Ty. Hi, I am Ty. I am, uh, I go by he, him pronouns. In the tabletop community, I am both a player as well as a designer. For a designer, I specifically focus on RPGs from adventures to creating maps as well as printable posters for inspiration. And I am bipolar. Okay, and uh, we have Jeb as well. Hi, I'm Jeb. My pronouns are my name or she, her. Uh, in the tabletop community, I am a designer of board games along with two others. Uh, I primarily focus on mechanics and player usability, uh, but I'm also an avid player of board games and some RPGs. I also have ADHD. <laughs> awesome. Okay, and just a, a little bit of housekeeping for those in the audience. When we're going through each question, we're going to go in this same audio, uh, order because I don't know a lot about captions and things yet. So as you can see, we have multiple caption boxes. And to make it easy for those that need captions, turns and the person with the yellow text up is obviously the person that you should be paying attention to. Our first point of talking is what is neurodiversity? Uh, we're aiming today to make neurodiversity and talking about accessibility and ableism a little less scary, a little less confronting, and a little easier to understand. Uh, Chantel has a wealth of information, as do we all. Um, but for the basics of my understanding as someone who is neurodiverse, neurodiversity is sort of an umbrella right now under which neurodevelopment Neurodevelopmental conditions such as autism, ADHD, bipolar, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, dyslexia, and synesthesia, and many more uh, come under. We're going to talk a little bit each about our own experiences with diversity and how that has uh, caused us difficulty and how we've dealt with it and just things that it can be experienced with neurodiversity as we go through. Um, with my ADHD, obviously, uh, as you just noticed, I can develop a bit of a tongue trip or a stutter. Uh, I tend to have memory issues and struggle to focus during games. Uh, these are all things that we are trying to sort of make more aware to everyone. Um, Nick, tell us uh, about your experience with your neurodiversity and gaming. Um, so, as I said before, my neurodiversity is ADHD. For me, it kind of, like, it characterizes in a way that I have uh, a lot of emotional issues, uh, which can be really centered on aggression sometimes if I get overstimulated. Um, I also have problems paying attention. I get distracted really easily. And um, overstimulation can really cause me to disassociate and not really be quite present in any situation so yeah and I have to manage that as well as having uh dual attention problems and that's how ADHD works for me and in with gaming and tabletop gaming um it's really become it's really plays out in a very different sense because I'm more hyper aware of my own ADHD and how it functions 
especially if certain tabletop gaming uh, overstimulates me. Yeah, it, um, it really can. Um, sure. Yeah, I tend to, um, specifically to do with uh, tabletop, I tend to hyper-focus, um, but I can also struggle with the distractive aspect of it you know, every situation. Um, in terms of dyscalculia, um, I am a finger counter, despite being a person doing a stats PhD or a psych PhD with a lot of statistics, I count everything on my fingers. Um, and so, and I love dice. So that's a, a struggle always. Um, synesthesia, I often struggle with a lot of loud noise or a lot of um, loud sound because I have sight sound synesthesia. So I can see what's being played. And if the music is too loud, then I will see the music rather than a battle map. And that can be quite challenging. I can really imagine how that would. Um, Ty, tell us about your experiences. Uh... As far as they relate to tabletop gaming, there's two ways it affects me uh, in particular. When I uh, run games or when I'm preparing to run games, I can get incredibly focused uh, at times just spending like I'll lose entire hours uh, in game prep, lore writing, uh, map designing, all of that fun stuff. But the downside of that is if anything tries to like pull me away from that, I can actually get a little bit aggressive about it. I get very snappy and snippy. Uh, so I thank my wife very much for being very patient with me, being very loving when I can be uh, a little short. Uh, the other part of that is when I'm running games or when I'm playing games even, it doesn't seem to matter if I'm having time of my life, whether I'm enjoying everything about it. It can be incredibly emotionally exhausting for me, so I find more often than not after a game, I will actually have a bit of a low spell. I'll actually go into a little bit of a depressive episode uh, either that same night or possibly it'll hit me in the morning. Yeah, what is about your experiences with neurodiversity and gaming? Well, um, so my ADHD uh, presents itself mostly in emotional dysregulation, like yourself, Nick, uh, executive dysfunction, and poor recall memory so you can imagine that um playing very complicated games um that's very very difficult um i find that in uh, rpg settings um the sort of first or second like first couple of games um i find it hard to emotionally connect with my character and then with everybody else's characters um, so it does take me a few sessions to get into it. Um, and with standard board games, I am the person that on, you know, everybody else's turn will get up and wander around because I have inattentive ADHD. So, um, if I don't have a dual focus, I will go and find something. So. <laughs> The same. I was literally uh, actually just checking work stuff while listening to everything just now. So I, I the dual focus thing here too. I, I have my um Torso burrito. <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah. So yeah. Some of the the different sort of things that we all experience. You've seen some commonalities there, but um, not every neurodiversity has the same symptoms. And the saying kind of goes, if you've met a neurodiverse person, you've met a neurodiverse person. Even people with the same condition have vastly different experiences. Um, but a lot of commonalities that we do have are emotional dysregulation, executive dysfunction, rejection sensitivity, time can be like time blindness. Uh, some neurodiverse people experience face blindness. Um, there's so many major ones like memory for one that was that just hit me again short-term memory working memory uh, there are so many things that affect us and that's sort of leading into the next section which is what is 
ableism, what does it look like? And how do we lessen it at the table? So um, I'm going to lead everyone around and we'll talk a little bit about some things that we've experienced personally and examples that we've noticed in the community uh, and how we recommend people deal with that instead of the negative things that can happen. We're, we're trying to come up with positive solutions. Ableism is a set of behavior. It's thoughts and habits that you've built up about how you expect people to behave. Uh, and in cases of things like invisible disabilities, including neurodiversities, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what somebody has. You don't know how they struggle. And making assumptions that they everyone is neurotypical can lead to misunderstandings and issues. It isn't overt bullying all the time. It can be very, very small things. Shopping centers having super, super, super bright, hard lights at all times and really loud jingles playing at all times. Because a lot of universe people experience sensory issues. Uh, myself, I have experienced things like getting that for having my phone out at the table. Um, getting berated for not remembering the rules to D&D &D perfectly every game. Um, for needing to do something else while I play any game. Even though I'm actively engaged and enjoying the game. Um, but this is because with my ADHD, I need to keep what I call my secondary focus engaged. If I sit here and just try to focus on you, the DM, and nothing else, in here I'm going to be going on a journey. I, you, you might not see it, or you might see me. I might go on a face journey, and you may be able to keep up, but I am not going to be at the table if I'm trying to sit still and just listen to one thing. So uh, we're going to do the same thing and go around the panel again and everyone can sort of talk about some experiences that they've had and things that they've noted in the community and how we can improve them. Nick, tell us about your experiences as a new player with a neurodiversity coming into the community. Yeah, so like I said, I am a pretty fresh player. Um, but the funny thing is, my first game was actually around three years ago. Um, and it was it was kind of so traumatizing for me in a way that I had to just stop playing and it took me a while to build up the confidence to get back into tabletop gaming in fact like the the type of ableism that I experienced just um made that type of made tabletop gaming inaccessible for me for a while um I remember I went to a friend's house it was just to hang out we were just I didn't have any expectations or anything because I thought it was just a normal hang and it got to the point where they sprung a game of D&D &D on me, and it would have been my first game, and I wasn't prepared for it. For me, with my ADHD, you can't surprise me with anything, or else I can't, or else I'm going to get overstimulated. Um, I won't be able to properly function mentally. I won't be able to take things in or output the right information. In fact, like. I get tongue-tied, I'll start to like really slip up on words and everything and I'll dissociate really badly because I just don't understand what's going on around me and I need to be mentally prepared for those situations. That was like the first instance of like, the, of this, of, of ableism that wasn't so in my face. It was just kind of like, was, they didn't really understand. They thought they were doing something which was nice and was inviting me. Um, but I think it got worse when our, uh, um, it's the phone thing where I have to have a phone on me at all times to scroll. And like, I'm not usually paying attention. It's like, it's just a habit. It's something that like keeps me, that it's, it's stimming for me. Um, it stimulates me and it keeps me calm. So it's usually just scrolling through Twitter or something. And I would do that while playing that game. And it got to the point that they got so angry at me and 
over the course of the game and like put it down and I'd put it down and I'd have to pick it up again. And it, they'd get so angry at me that they just all started to berate me at the table. And I was like, I'm, I have to leave because it was so incredibly traumatizing. Um, I just left the situation. And the next day they kind of came up to me and they said, you can't play with us anymore, despite that not being my intention. And they were like, um, if you want to do if you want to come over again, you'll probably have to take a chill pill or something, just chill out, um, which is annoying. And that's a very annoying phrase to use for anyone with the neurodiversity. But um, it's it got to the point that I was like, look, I if this is going to be my experience with tabletop gaming, I have to take a step back. And it's interesting because it, it, I wouldn't say it was bullying. I would just say that those that they truly didn't understand. But also with that, they weren't trying to understand either. And that can be a really big problem. And ableism doesn't need to be like when you confront someone with it, it doesn't need to be a scary thing. Um, if someone says that actually this isn't working out and you know what, I think you're just being ableist or you're just saying things that and doing things that are quite, that are like upsetting me um, emotionally in any sort of way, it's all about communication really. And you can really, you got to really communicate what's going on because if you don't, like I did, because I wasn't very good, I wasn't very good at communication back then. Um, I just kind of let a lot of emotions get to me. Um, but yeah, it's about communicating and understanding. And if someone says that you're being ableist, it's about listening and being like, okay, how do I correct that? How do I do better? Yeah, it's that that's exactly it. It doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be a big confrontation. You don't have to be defensive when someone uses ableism conversation. It just means that you're doing a behavior that doesn't necessarily take my needs into consideration. But Chantel, you could probably speak to this a bit more as well. Uh yeah, I would say any any word that has ism or ist in it is behavioral. It's not a personal, uh, it's not a judgment on the person. It's a judgment on a behavior. And the behavior can change, like any behavior can change. It just takes time and it takes effort and a desire to. Um, in terms of uh, my own experiences of... Um, not so much uh, ableism. I, I don't. I don't know that I've experienced a great deal of ableism, but I've had a lot more um, discussions with people about sort of how to engage and how not to engage, particularly with me in tabletop, um, because I tend to uh, the, the games that I tend to play tend to be highly. Uh, narrative tend to be highly role play focused um and because i also come from an acting background tend to be sort of very emotional it's not it's not unexpected or unsurprising to sort of turn up to a stream and and find me just sort of sitting there bawling my eyes out that's not unexpected and i'm not in pain while i'm doing it it's more catharsis and it's a good way to sort of if anything it it helps me focus oddly um but the the flip side to that is if I need to disconnect from a character, there are a couple of things that I do and a couple of things that, you know, um, friends also do um, inside and, and coming out of games. Um, so the first one is um, whenever I'm not part of a scene, I tend to be using Play-Doh or, in fact, I recently I'm waiting for some um, fidgets to arrive now. I'm really excited. Um so I will have some actual fidgets instead of just Play-Doh, which I've been using for the last like year and a half. Um, so if I'm not in a scene, it just takes me out of it. It gives me a bit of a break, a bit of time away. Um, there will be times when we just take a break because we had a big scene. Um, there will be times when, you know, that's where sort of safety tools come in. And that's the importance of safety tools is, hey, you all okay? I'm feeling a bit morally ambiguous right now. How about we use those? Um, 
I would say I haven't, I mean, as part of the community, the wider community, particularly when you get down to things like Twitter, um, there's a lot of, a lot that people just don't understand um, in terms of how people function and that everyone functions differently. Um, and that for some people, like there's, there's a lot of discussion going on at the moment in terms of, you know, the, the you know, how do, how do I communicate with someone? Like if you could get rid of uh, a disability, wouldn't you want to? Well, maybe you would, but maybe someone else wouldn't. And it's just about very, very carefully discussing, the, having that discussion. And f what is for, for one person, yes, I would like to change that, or I don't want this to be part of my world. For another person, it's actually, I really want to explore that as who I am or part of who I am in the world overall, because we all play games for different reasons. That's, that's exactly right. We just say, like, not everyone wants to change their thing, but they would like the world to be a little more aware of them and work with them. Hmm. We don't necessarily want people to, you know, treat us differently to everybody else. We just want everyone to be a little more conscientious of each other and that everyone's a bit different. Everyone needs slightly different things. And what Chantel pointed out was actually really cool with the taking a break thing. It's a lot of the time is part of the thing with being neurodiverse is that emotional dysregulation. And so we connect very strongly with our characters. Often we can't help but put a lot of ourselves into the character when we're playing. So yeah, if a scene is particularly emotional and then we're moving on to suddenly it's nightfall, everyone's gone to sleep and we're off on the adventure again the next day. The character may have moved on, but we haven't. Um, we, we, full disclosure, we did try to record this previously and that is something that Chantel specifically said, that, you know, he might not have moved on. The character may have, but Chantel mm. hasn't. So, Especially if you're on stream and you can do so, taking a five minute ad break, but everyone can have a glass of water, take a few deep breaths, be with their Play Doh or their sketchbook, or you know, just go and get some fresh air outside in the cool night air. It's cool here. I know it's quite hot overseas right now for Thai. <laughs> um, that is a really important thing to do for your neurodiverse friends and players. That will lead to everybody having a better time, everybody getting a better result out of themselves and each other for the game that you're playing. Um, well, on that note, I'm going to move on to Ty, who's enjoying that sweet, sweet American heat right now. Uh, I wouldn't call it sweet, but we will call it heat. So one of the biggest resounding memories uh, I have of kind of almost being ashamed of uh, how I deal with things was from very early on in my uh, RPG experience, which actually set me back on DMing for, I think, at least a good two years. Uh, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, how I can get extremely focused in on world building and like everything else becomes a blur to me. Um, once I had kind of like revealed that to one of the players at a fellow community, of RPG players and how I'd built this world. I'd like set up a map of the entire world, even though we were going to be using like a small city for a one shot. There was no reason to build a world. There was no reason to make a country map. There was no reason to like flesh out the economics and the political structure. But I still did it because that's something that A, I enjoy, and B, it was just something that happened. I kind of got like, I don't want to say accused, but they started making jabs at being obsessed and going overboard and delving too much into it. Um, and kind of like that kind of mentality of where I felt like it wasn't acceptable to have done this. Um, and I don't know. It, it was something that, uh, like I said, it kind of made me feel ashamed about everything. Uh, I think 
in order to solve that, it just needs open communication on how how my brain works. I think at that time I was still trying to understand it myself, so it wasn't something I could properly communicate. I just thought this clearly is something that isn't done by people in the RPG community. Fortunately, these days I have a very accepting group, though. I love them very much. Great, because that sounds like an amazing game. I would do the same thing. You know, like, like you, you, I don't know if Chantel has seen it, but I know the rest of you have seen it. Currently creating a body horror comedy <laughs> monster supplement. Oh, yes. Out of just a joke in my D&D game. Somebody said something in a way that tickled my little ADHD brain, and I started drawing, and then suddenly everybody's nightmares came to life, and it's coming to drive through RPG very soon. I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but you can check my Twitter <laughs> and you will see it. Uh, so it's very easy for all of us with neurodiversities to just get especially in uh, uh, the RPG world or if we're designing a board game to just run with it because it tickles all those favorite little, little spots in our brains it gets us thinking it gets us excited and it hits that hyper focus point so please if someone you know has done something like that even if it's for a one shot or a longer campaign and they have just obviously had fun with it it's not obsession it might be hyper focus but like we do it because we enjoy it it's like this has got me excited i want to make more and oh this thing gave me an idea for this thing and this thing gave me an idea for that thing next thing you know we've got a textbook but please just be happy for us just be like oh wow you look like you had a great time writing all of that And that huge difference to, because I can guarantee you, your neurodiverse friend who did all of that may not be aware of it yet, but they are probably very, very anxious about showing it to you. Because we've had those reactions so many times before where we've gotten taken by the hyperfocus bug and really had a great time working hard on something. Because of our rejection sensitivity as well, take that real hard. Um, on like, I, if anybody watched in unison yesterday, um, Critical Bard and Kelly the Opera Geek were talking about a lot of things like this, where the community were comparing them to each other, and action sensitivity, and already feeling imposter syndrome, which we all struggle with and stuff, really hit them hard. And these two wonderful people who seem perfectly fitted to be friends barely spoke for such a long time because the community got them all up in their heads by comparing them all the time don't do that don't do that to anyone especially don't do that to neurodiverse people don't compare us to somebody else because that's just gonna get us up in our heads just go that's very cool you had a good time. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with That's normalizing and being happy for everyone. Exactly. You can do something cool without it necessarily having anything to do with somebody else that's done something similar. Uh, Jeb, tell us about your uh, take on this as well. Okay, so um, I'm very fortunate uh, to have not experienced any kind of um, ableism or negative reactions to um, my ADHD and emotional dysregulation um, as part of the board games community. But growing up, I was the overly sensitive, overly emotional person that uh, cried all the time and was very fun to make angry when I was very tired. Um, so that was, that's about as um, close to that uh, as I can probably get. Um, but uh, my partner, uh, the first time he ever played Pandemic, um, 
the rules were explained in sort of like the big world concept and not what the personal rules were for his gameplay. Um, so he couldn't take it in, got very lost in the rules, and it ended up that somebody else basically just played for him uh, and he got very anxious about, you know, why he was even there, whether he would ever play this game again. Um, so that could have been avoided with somebody who had sort of sat down and explained what his character specifically did, what his specific goals should be. Um, but again, it comes down to communication. Um, in terms of things that I've seen in the community, um, because I don't play as many RPGs as everybody else here does, um, we do a lot of board game days. Um, I've seen, or well, I've been to a few, uh, whether it's, you know, 50 people, <laughs> uh, usually for International Tabletop Day. Um, and people just sort of tend to go off in their own little groups and do their own thing. But when it's uh, a smaller group, we we tend to run those. So um, we've put into place our own kind of set of really inclusive rules. Um, we always start with the same game. Everybody who comes basically GMs a game, whether it's uh, a quick card game or um, something that's more involved and narrative driven. We have a lot of breaks in between games. Um, we play records. We have a, quite an extensive vinyl collection. So we'll play those um, to either match the game we're playing or as our downtime music. Um, there's, there's never pressure. We always have sort of an opt in and out rule. So if we start playing something and somebody doesn't feel comfortable playing that anymore um like for instance i struggle really badly with social deduction games because that triggers a lot of emotional uh, response in me you can just sort of hands out go have a sit down or or whatever or we have an opt-in as well so if we've started around somebody's just observing going mm, i don't really know if i want to play this game but then decide actually yeah i do we accommodate that as well. So there's never, um, oh, you didn't start playing when we all started playing, so you just miss out, too bad for you. So um, having those sort of social rules within a board game's day where you're playing more than one thing throughout the course of a day um, can make all the difference for neurodiverse and neurotypical alike um, because there is no pressure. So. Uh, I think that's something that smaller groups could um, learn a lot from. And I think it would just help <laughs> in general just to uh, be a bit more accommodating to other groups. That's really, really good point. And that's like a really good idea is just that being aware of each other and taking each other into consideration make me think of something that I saw people talking about um, you know, on Twitter and Facebook in the recent days to do with neurodiversity as well, which is, and I'm going to get everyone to tell me what they think about this as well, um, timers at the table. I have seen people talking about people that are new to the game or having difficulty making their decisions for their turn. And people keep suggesting the table that'll light a fire under them that'll make them take their turn quicker if they know they've got a timer or they miss their turn this does not work very well for neurodiverse people it's not going to work very well for anyone but sudden pressure is just going to make everything worse for most of us of us thrive under those conditions but it's i don't if you put a timer on the table while i'm playing a game with you i am packing up and going home if you're gonna take my turn away 
instead of taking the time to find out why I might be struggling to make a decision if I don't understand certain aspects of the rule. Maybe I'm a bit anxious that day and need a little help understanding the situation. Or maybe my short-term memory's gone and I can't remember what just happened. To your players. Talk to me. Check in with me if I'm taking a while. Because chances are something like that has happened and I just need a little bit of help. Um, yeah, so Nick, time is at the table. Uh, I'm just going to say it. From my experience, timers are just not accessible. They are stressful as. Um, I would say my first experience with a type of timer situation for, for any type of game would be chess club back in when I was in school. And, like, initially I was into chess club. Like, I, I could work with it. I understood how it worked. It was really stimulating for my brain. And as soon as they introduced timers, like having to press the clock down, um, and I was out. I was gone. I was like, I can't deal with this. This is too stressful. Um, timers just, they, for me, if, if I see an hourglass in a board game, I'm like, we're not playing with that or I'm gone. That's just it. I, it's a hard no. It's a hard no. Hotel. I know you like Euro games, and I don't know how many of them have timers involved, but not a large number that I play. Um, I love a Euro game, um, but the whole point of Euro games is that they're sort of at your own pace generally, and so timers not so much there. I I'm I'm mixed. I'm a mixed one on this one because the idea of time pressure, like part of the reason why I'm getting um, assessed for ADHD in the first place is that I um, respond really well to deadlines. So as soon as you give me a deadline, my my brain kind of goes, yeah, now is a good time to do this. So I start to hyper-focus on the thing that needs doing. Um, I, I like a timer, but I don't like an unexpected timer. So if it's in a board game where the intention is that you're supposed to make an impulsive sudden decision then I'm like okay cool because the outcome doesn't matter like the whole point of it is that the outcome doesn't matter the second you put um a timer or an hourglass down on a table in a uh, tabletop depending on the game and depending on how it's framed like if you if it's framed as in you're going to lose your turn if you don't do something I can't do it I'm out I've got no ability to manage that but if you say okay so this is the amount of time we have overall as a group let's try to work with this then i i could probably manage it yeah no i agree if it's like if it's a countdown to doom sort of timer that's part of the game if it's a yeah. if you guys don't finish this dungeon in two hours presented by this hourglass the whole thing is going to collapse. That's, and that, you know, that's an expected element of the story. But yeah, if you go, you know, you have this much time to take your turn or else somebody else is going instead, that's not going to work for me. Mm -mm. Uh, time. Time is at the table. So in regards to board games, I know we've played a few games with that come with like little hourglasses and I'm fairly certain every single one of those games we did regard the RS. Because I think generally all of the players kind of just unanimously agree, no, I think we'd enjoy this game more without that. Uh, but in terms of RPGs, I'm actually of the same mind. I don't think they're good as a tool for managing turns. I think if you want to do something that helps kind of the flow of combat, then just let the person know who's up next. Having a good initiative like uh, display to see so people know uh, who's up next, how long they've got approximately. Um, because I know one of the things um, with myself is I like to I like to know what's coming up. I like to have time to prepare, to adjust, to mentally kind of figure things out. Um, so giving them that option and then letting them know at the start of the person before his turn, hey, you're going to be up next um, to person B. I think that's more effective as a timer. But 
as a narrative tool or as a tool to indicate the regularity of something i think it's a great uh it's a great tool in rpgs like for example my uh, players were scaling a mountain cliff and i let them know every time this hourglass went off there was going to be a huge gust of wind uh so that gave them incentive to try and like actually break into this crypt that was on the side of a mountain before they got swept off um nothing bad happened to them and I think it really added to the moment. Yeah, that's that's a really cool use of a timer. I, I do like that. Like, yeah, like if it adds to the game, yes. If it's putting a penalty on a player for no reason, that's not so cool. Um, what you mentioned there about the letting the player know that it's their turn next is a really good idea. I have a really good DM who does that. Um, some of you would know him from Twitter already, Dungeon Dive Dan. Uh, he's got his podcast, Quips and Crits, and he's my regular DM, and he does that. He very clearly outlines the initiative at the start of combat, so we know what order we're going in, and then about halfway through someone's turn, or when he thinks their turn is approaching the end, he'll say, you're on deck, letting us know to start thinking about our turn and what we're going to do, because it's just about our time. Uh, Jeb, for you, time is at the table. Uh, it depends on the game. So uh, there are three games that we play, and they all use a timer. One, uh, you don't have to, but we choose to. So uh, Machine of Death uh, is a... We play it um, as a team-based thing. Um, and it's a it's an assassination game. You have a a target, and you have to agree on how to kill this particular person. Um, but the you make a decision, and then you see if it works. The timer comes into play to see if it works, and you have like a certain amount of time because if it doesn't work, you have to basically on the fly change your plan. Um, but again, that's in a group setting. Um, the other game is Galaxy Trucker. So at the very beginning. You use a timer to get your pieces um, to build your spaceship. And if you haven't correctly created your spaceship in that time, any piece that isn't connected will float away into space. So again, it's a team thing. Everybody's under the same pressure. And uh, we also use it for code names. Um, it's included in the box as an optional tool, but we find that it actually helps um, make us make decisions and discuss in our teams rather than everybody sort of sitting around going no oh, well I think it might be this what do you think I don't know it could be that but it could be this and then you do that for half an hour so um those kinds of games uh it, it seems to assist <laughs> but if yeah you sprung it on me while I was playing yeah, like a euro for some reason you're just like oh you're taking too long here's, here's a timer <laughs> that that would just confuse me more than anything um and i don't i personally don't think that um in those kind of settings where it's just because somebody is impatient uh i don't feel that that has any benefit at all <laughs> And this was actually a really good lead in to the next section, which is accessibility. And part of that is design. But what we'll start with is the uh, environmental accessibility. Things you can do at the table and at your game night, whether that's an RPG night or a board game night or a poker night, make your environment more accessible for neurodiverse people. Things like what we mentioned earlier, um, taking note of whether someone has a neurodiversity and checking in whether there's something you can do to help them with their split focus and, or stimming, that if you don't want phones at the table for whatever reason, talk to your player and find an alternative. 
something that they can do to use that hyper focus. I, I personally like to have a sketchbook at the table. I, I'm an artist. I like to have a little sketchbook and a pencil and I'll doodle away. Usually, you know, just D and D monster designs while I'm taking my, you know, waiting to take my turn. But I'm doing that while I'm watching everybody else and listening because my hand is going and the, my back burner brain is thinking about what I'm drawing. I can actually pay attention to the words that are being said. I'm not forgetting what everybody's sentences are uh, and, and things like that. Um, my partner, likes music on in the background too loud playing my partner has autism and adhd um and my partner likes a nice smell in the background while we play uh, that can help them immerse in the game but also if they're having a stressful day like a pleasant we've got uh, one of those cantrip candles the library scented one and there's that sort of nice light smell helps create a relaxing atmosphere for them so they feel less anxious before we play. Uh, and they have a puzzle game on their phone that they play to help them stim so they're not feeling too pent up at the table. Uh, Nick, what are some ways that you think are good for increasing accessibility at game night? Well, from from what I from what I've like I've experienced is that we need to understand that like neurodiversity is for the most part are invisible so just because you you might be playing with some new people you might not actually know that someone has a neuro neurodiversity and they also might not be so so totally able to just speak up and say yeah i've got this so it's about so for me i found that it's helpful to open the floor if i'm ever playing playing with a new group of people um i've been to some games where they pretty much outright ask um, before starting and preparation is if anyone has a neurodiversity, if they've had, if they have, um, or if they need any extra help or extra assistance, um, which is actually really helpful um, for me. For some people, it probably won't be. Um, it's different for everyone. Um, but for me in particular, um, phone. <laughs> if I have my phone and I can just scroll, scroll on it, whatever it is. It doesn't mean I'm not paying attention to you. It means I'm paying. It, it means I just need action. I need action on my hands. Those motor skills need to be working. And I'm not taking anything in on my phone. My whole attention's on the board, but it's just helpful. Yep. No, that's exactly exactly right. Um, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah. If if you feel comfortable, disclose your own neurodiversity at the start of a new gaming group and open the floor to other people to be like, oh yeah, I have that too, actually. This is what I, I do when I'm playing to help me focus. Or have a quiet word to whoever's running the game night. If you're running the game night, maybe send all your players a quick text message beforehand. Again, these are some basic things that I like to take into consideration to help my players this apply to you on that note actually uh i'm going to talk about it more in depth when we get to the next section but the monty cook consent in rpgs checklist is a really good thing for that because it lets you get a gauge for if people have uh sensitivities to certain things that you can then be aware of and not spring on someone uh Chantel, what do you think are some good ways to improve environmental accessibility um, generally speaking, I would say having a good, having patience for yourself and having patience for everyone at the table, doesn't matter whether you're playing a board game or a TTRPG, um, question yourself and your own reaction and your own responses to whatever it is that might be getting in the way of, or that you might be perceiving as getting in the way of the game. Um, if you are struggling with phones at the table, what is it about previous experiences that you've had of phones at the table? Um, and how close to, you know, what's happening right now is that experience? Um, we all have such different experiences, playing different games, doing different things with different people. One, a boundary for one person might not need to be a boundary that you apply to every person um and that can be 
so helpful. Um, the idea of normalizing experiences is so, so important and so big. Like just saying, oh, you struggle with this? I struggle with that too. That's that's cool. And it can open up a discussion. Like even if, you know, it what you're experiencing isn't as big or isn't as severe or isn't, you know, you don't, you feel like it's not as important. The fact that you started the conversation means that the conversation can continue. And that's probably the biggest thing. Um, and I think the most important thing for me is that conversation is ongoing like you don't sort of have one session zero and then you're done you have session zero you set what the ground rules are and then you have sort of a mini session zero every session because how I feel like how how overstimulated I might feel on any given day changes based on everything in life um mm -hmm. and the extent to which you know like one day I might be absolutely fine with mental arithmetic and people the next day people might be like, okay, you don't know what two plus three is. And I'm like, well, not today. I'm too overstimulated today to really know what that is without using my hands. So, or this is a really, you know, stressful moment in the game because I'm, you know, big things could happen. Yes. I'm going to need to use my hands for this because it's scary and I'm scared and that's a great thing, but you've got to just give me some time to figure it out. Um, so yeah, patience and communication just as an ongoing thing for me are huge. Yeah, that's a really good point. Check in with your players at the start of every game, see how everyone's doing. Play through the game. It's a quick check in. Pretty good. Uh, Ty, how do you think people can improve like table accessibility? Um, so I want to quickly offer a couple of other uh stimming options that I know my players do. So my wife actually knits during our games and that seems to have helped her a lot. Uh, one of uh, my other players, uh, she crochets, although she hasn't done that in a while. She recently let me know that she's going to try uh, playing Sudoku during games and seeing how that does. So stimming can kind of come from a lot of different unexpected or possibly unexpected avenues. Um, and my personal uh, advice is always going to be communication. Um, always start out by kind of talking to each of your players, like Chantal was saying, and kind of setting that precedence for continuing those talks. Like when I first started my current uh, campaign two plus years ago, I let everyone know that I was bipolar and that I could have depressive episodes. But even personally, even though I did that, I didn't actually like give myself permission for some reason to talk about that until maybe this year where I started being more comfortable and saying, hey, I'm actually feeling pretty terrible today and I'm going to have to reschedule. I hope that's okay. And since then, the group has been getting more and more comfortable talking with each other and with me and actually checking up on one another, um, which is only a good thing, I think. That's a really good thing to encourage as well, is uh, getting your players to check in with each other. So everyone is comfortable talking to and with each other exactly. about how you're doing. Jeb, what do you think are good ways to improve their accessibility and environmental factors? Um, I sort of gave my list before. <laughs> I jumped the gun a little bit. Um, but, like, the fact, you know, I have this burrito in my hand which is from a game called through through burrito uh, we generally have these out on the table um just throughout the games day um and it like they'll get passed around with everybody and we have neurodiverse and neurotypical players um and everybody sort of has a go squishing a burrito at some point um the other thing is don't be afraid to Splurge on like the fancier tokens or the fancy dice. So um, one of the games that I love playing is Arkham Horror, and uh, Fantasy Flight actually have created blessed and cursed dice for when you have that, um, like your player character um, gets that condition, so that you don't have to remember that all of a sudden 
oh, I succeed on a four, five, and six instead of just a five and six, or I only succeed on a six. You don't have to remember that. The dice tell you that. Um, and, you know, instead of getting um, just like little cardboard tokens, you can get ones that um, like are little plastic hearts. So, you know, oh, these are my um, stamina tokens, you know, and you don't have to worry about like, oh, did I lose this one little tiny piece of red paper? Now I don't have enough stamina for everybody. Like it's, and it's something else that you can play with um, as a stimming or multi-focus thing as well. So I think it's just um, about swapping out and adding on to games um, with yeah. like things that the designers have actually provided for you um, that can just help with a lot of those like memory and like stimulation um, issues. So yep. yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point, and that's something that we would normally go into a bit more in depth with. Which we're running out of time, which is accessibility tools and specific physical ways designers can make their games more accessible. But Jennifer Kretschmer, Dreamwisp on Twitter, recently released a huge list of disability accessibility resources, which includes neurodiverse and other disability resources. Um, we will be, we, have you seen the, in the chat, there's a whole bunch of resources that we have been linking throughout the discussion. Um, and you can talk to all of us on Twitter and we will be happy to point you in the direction of other physical player aids. But a key thing before we wrap up for any designers that are watching, talk to the community and make, this is my personal advice, make an OGL, like what Wizards of the Coast has, like what Pathfinder has, an open gaming license and let disabled creators create accessibility tools for your game. If you like them, buy them. Or the disabled community, if someone makes something that makes your game more accessible to the disabled community, pay them. Pay them to for the rights, pay them for royalties. Help them make more stuff like that. Uh, but we're hitting the end of our time right now, so we'll go around the panelists again. And if everyone can let us know where to find them with Nick. Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash Nick Topher. That's Nick with a H, not a K. Um, you can also find me at youtube.com forward slash Nicholas Topher. Uh, you can find me at Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash Lightfoot Rogue. And you can also find me on TikTok at tiktok.com forward slash at Nick Ritchie. Awesome. Chantel, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Chantel B. Um, you can find me on my website, which is wordswithcolor.com. Um, you can often find me emoting um, on twitch.tv forward slash do respite, um, where I stream games. Awesome. Ty, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter, which is where I spend probably more time than I should. Uh, at uh, metal underscore and underscore magic and you can find all of my content on www, www I lost count dot of metal and magic dot com awesome Jeb where can people find you um, if you're interested in the game I have the biggest sword uh, it, I have the biggest sword dot com that's all one word um, the Twitter for our games company is at Golia Games, and that's G O L I A R D Games. I'm um, not super active there at the moment because our graphic designer has moved to Norway. He will come back at some point. <laughs> um, and uh, myself and my partner Tom, who is also part of Goliad Games, uh, we run the Ice Cream Social Experiment, which is the alcohol free network event that is normally run as part of MIGWA every year, but this year, sadly, it will not go ahead. Um, but if you want to find out what we're doing, we are at T and J underscore InSpace on Twitter. 
Excellent. And I am Sean Sunday. You can find me pretty much everywhere and there's some variation of Sean Sunday art. And I run an Australian Illustrators Discord and an Australian TTRPG Creatives Discord. And you can find the links of those in my link tree, which is in my Twitter bio. Uh, we have been the Neurodiverse Squad for today. We have so many more things we could talk about, and we may get back together again in the future and do so again. Thank you for joining us. Uh, check the Twitch chat for all of the links. And until next time, be nice to each other. <laughs>